Good afternoon. This month marks the first anniversary of this series of lectures and seminars sponsored by the Examining Division. For a year now, we've been bringing you knowledgeable speakers, um, people from the copyright bar, speakers from the industry certified copyright, and speakers from other government agencies, hoping that hearing their point of view will expand your knowledge of the world of copyright from beyond your own desk in the copyright office. As we continue the series in the coming year, we hope you'll continue to support us by attending and by encouraging others to attend. Any suggestions you have about speakers or topics are always welcome. Our distinguished guest today certainly brings a view that's well beyond the immediate mission of the Copyright Office. Harvey Winter is the director of the Office of Business Practices at the State Department, where he was formerly chief of the Division of International Business Practices. Over the last 25 years, Harvey has represented the interests of the United States at a number of conferences, and I'd like to mention just a few of those. The fifth session of the Intergovernmental Copyright Committee in London, the Intellectual Property Diplomatic Conference in Stockholm, the Diplomatic Conference on a Patent Cooperation Treaty in Washington, the Diplomatic Conference on the Universal Copyright Convention in Paris, the Conference on Communication Satellites Convention in Brussels, and the Diplomatic Conference on the Phonogram Convention in Geneva. As you can see, it's a miracle that we found a week that he was in town to come to speak with us. Mr. Winter graduated with highest honors from the University of Buffalo. He's been a teaching fellow at George Washington University, a historian with the National Park Service, an archivist with the National Archives. He's been the recipient of numerous awards and honors, and among them, the State Department's Superior Honor Award. We should probably call our session today a view from both sides because, as you can see, we have a distinguished inside guest, Lewis Flax. The sage and witty Mr. Flax has been a longtime member of the Copyright Office staff, and he's presently a policy planning advisor to the Register. Mr. Wender and Mr. Flax have worked together for a number of years on many issues that involve the Copyright Office and the State Department. And their dialogue today, I believe, will focus on some of the most pertinent issues. Please welcome Harvey Winter and Lewis Flax. I'm going to say just a few words. Jody's managed to cover and very briefly and effectively things would take me a long time to say. And now I don't have to say anything nice about Harvey at all. She said it all. Except that he's been both a witness and a participant in copyright history and a very talented and perceptive observer of that history over at least the last 20 or 25 years. The roots of the relationship between the Copyright Office and the State Department parallel the relationships in cultural matters of an international nature between the State Department and the Library of Congress, of which we're a part. There were great partnerships at the turn of the century between librarians of Congress and registers of copyright. In particular, Librarian of Congress Putnam uh, and the Register of Copyrights Torvald Solberg, great supporters both of international copyright, committed to bringing the United States into a system of just respect to the rights of foreign authors, just as a, a matter of not only comedy and good manners, but fundamental natural rights. The vehicle for their pursuit of this objective started out as the Berne Convention of 1883 to which Salberg devoted his entire life as a public and a private citizen. Indeed, we have in our Copyright Office a handwritten note to the Washington Post late in Salberg's life when he was retired, urging yet once again U.S. adherence to the Berne Convention. Times changed. The United States law developed. That uh, goal was not achieved. But other challenges were presented to bring the United States into international copyright, many of which Harvey was involved in. Now, these uh, concern uh, in particular the developments which followed upon the registership of Arthur Fisher. Those of you who may have read Waldo Moore's very excellent little studies of registers of copyright will note that not only the modern era in international copyright for the United States, but the very structure of the Copyright Office in its administration and its personnel practices were determined back in the late 1940s by Arthur Fisher, who died in 1960. And with the passage of the Copyright Act in 1978, the Fisher regime can be said to have, in effect, come to an end. 
all of his objectives, many of which he did not live to see, were accomplished. Um, as I said, Harvey has been involved in almost every issue of major importance in international copyright treaty affairs. But the Office of Business Practices, which he heads, concerns more than just copyright, but the whole range of intellectual property, including patents and trademarks and business practices, including unfair competition and antitrust matters. The uh, problems that he deals with run the gamut. Uh, they concern problems of large corporations, individual authors. They concern problems of protecting things as new as computer software and uh, as old as, you know, classic American dramas in Greece. Um, they concern the protection of t-shirts. They concern the protection of high art. All of the aspects of American popular culture reflected in worldwide industry. Now, as I noted at the beginning, uh, the relationship that we've always had with the State Department, providing information, providing counsel, and often at the request of the State Department, providing support to U.S. delegations to international copyright meetings, diplomatic working groups, and the like, has been going on for a very long time. It started with Byrne, and those of you who've read copyright notices and seen what's going on in front of the Senate committee know that once again, we've come full circle, and Byrne is before us again. Without adding anything else, I'd like to turn the microphone over to Harvey. Thank you, Lewis. I'm glad that uh, I also thank Jody for those very kind remarks. I'm glad that you referred to the uh, negotiation of the Berne Convention in 1883. I assure you I was not involved in that. <laughs> Makes me feel a little less ancient. Uh, I understand that Lewis and I are to talk today about the working relationships between the Copyright Office and the Department of State, with the emphasis on, of course, international copyright matters. Uh, I'm going to skip the minutia of all the work we do day to day on telegrams, position papers, whatever, and decide the best way to approach this topic is perhaps to go back in time and review the highlights of the relations between the Copyright Office and my office, the Office of Business Practices. Before the preparatory work for the proposed Universal Copyright Convention and the actual negotiation of this convention in Geneva 1952, the United States was not actively involved in international copyright matters. As you know, our copyright relations with some of the Latin American governments were based on the Buenos Aires, <coughs> excuse me, Buenos Aires Convention of 1910, and with a number of other governments on the basis of friendship, commerce, and navigation treaties, and presidential proclamations. Unquestionably, the register of copyrights that brought us into the 20th century in the international copyright field was Arthur Fisher a dynamic and almost overpowering figure. And the vehicle he used, of course, was the Universal Copyright Convention. The U.S. role in international copyright at that time was probably best described by Barbara Ringer in an article on international copyright matters. Barbara wrote, quote, until the Second World War, the United States had little reason to take pride in its international copyright relations. In fact, it had a great deal to be ashamed of. With few exceptions, its role in international copyright was marked by intellectual short-sightedness, political isolationism, and narrow economic self-interest. The leadership of the United States in developing and implementing the Universal Copyright Convention in the 1950s represented a sharp and admirable change in direction. Back at the time of the diplomatic conference for the negotiation of the UCC in 1952, the present Office of Business Practices was known as the Business Practices and Technology Staff. The head of that office was a fellow by the name of Roger Dixon, who was an advisor in the U.S. delegation together with Arthur Fisher. And the U.S. delegation was headed by Luther Evans, your Librarian of Congress at that time. From this time forward, the Copyright Office and the State Department became increasingly involved in multilateral and bilateral copyright matters. The UCC came into force in 1955, and the first meeting of the Intergovernmental Copyright Committee established by that convention was held soon thereafter. The U.S. was elected to the Intergovernmental Committee at its first meeting and has been a member of that 
Committee ever since. This, of course, has been a most important forum for the United States on substantive international copyright matters, and this, this committee meets jointly with the Executive Committee of the Berne Copyright Convention, a convention which Lewis has noted we are not a party to, and is probably the most important forum we have on substantive copyright matters. In undertaking a broad stroke survey of the past three decades in the international copyright area, it is impossible to divorce personalities from historical events and developments. During the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, in addition to Arthur Fisher, whom I've already mentioned, there are three people that should be singled out for their strong influence on these developments. Barbara Ringer, who served in various capacities in the Copyright Office, in UNESCO as head of the Copyright Division, and finally as Register of Copyright. Arpad Bosch, who was brought to the Copyright Office in 1954 as legal counselor by Arthur Fisher, where he served until 1963 following which he became first deputy director of what the organization known by the euphonious acronym of Burpee from 1963 to 1970, and then of the World Intellectual Property Organization from 70 to 73, and director general of that organization since that time. And in September of this year, IPAD was reelected to a, a third six-year term. And finally, the third person was one that I'm sure many of you know and thought very highly of and fondly of, Abraham Kamenstein, known to Cammy by all of us, who served in various positions in the Copyright Office and then Register of Copyrights from 1960 to 1971. The first diplomatic conference at which I worked with the Copyright Office was held at The Hague in November 1960 and concerned the Hague Agreement for International Deposit of De Industrial Designs. This agreement, of course, was not a copyright agreement, but the Copyright Office's involvement arose from Arthur Fisher's interest in developing sui generis design protection in the United States. Most unfortunately, Arthur became seriously ill with leukemia and passed away at about the time of the diplomatic conference. The result was that Arpad Bosch, from the Copyright Office, and Pat Federico, a brilliant lawyer and mathematician from the Patent Office, became co-chairman of the U.S. delegation, with me somewhere in between these two very headstrong individuals. My most vivid recollections of the Hague Conference were that the weather in November in the Netherlands was terrible, somewhat worse than our present D.C. weather. We had more problems within the U.S. delegation than we had with the foreign delegations. <laughs> and Arpad Bosch, working around the clock for 24 hours on the closing day of the conference, with my role uh, bringing in some scotch for the other delegations to keep them occupied, <laughs> and the fact that the U.S. never ratified the Hague Agreement. Louis, did you have something yeah. you want to Yeah. This is a theme that will recur. The United States has this habit of exercising tremendous leadership in having these people meet in places and prepare agreements which we then don't ratify. Um, <laughs> Harvey, when, when Harvey mentioned he was talking about the Hague Agreement, I, uh, I'm not a specialist in that particular area, and I was, well, that's kind of interesting. They didn't ratify that, but they did have a very strong leadership role. And I think in a couple of the other agreements that Harvey was going to talk about, the Rome Convention, uh, uh, the Rome Convention for Neighboring Rights was another thing where Kamenstein was the Rapporteur General and we didn't ratify that either. My favorite is something I'm sure you won't mention, which is the 1946 Washington Convention, an inter-American treaty which we decided was going to reproduce within the Americas the essential principles of the Berne Convention so that we could, in effect, have our Berne cake and, not, and eat it at the same time. Um, at, at least within the hemisphere. And everybody came to Washington at a fine time. Everybody ratified the Washington Convention except the United States. And um, nobody thought about it again until many, many years later, in Harvey's office, a problem came up with the Dominican Republic, which turned around and said, why, we don't have copyright relations with the United States. We're a member of the Washington Convention, and you're not. <laughs> 
It all comes around. Uh, well, having said that, I'll talk about another conference that we did not ratify. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the first major conference that the Copyright Office and the State Department were involved in, that at least during my uh, career in the State Department, was the Rome Neighboring Rights Diplomatic Conference in October 1961. Cami headed the U.S. delegation, and Arpad Bosch and I were advisors on the, on the delegation. It was a long, difficult meeting characterized by numerous disagreements, again in the U.S. delegation, between the producers of copyrighted materials and the performers groups. These disagreements still exist today, with the result, as Lewis has already noted, that the United States has never joined the Rome Convention. The uh, next major development in the international copyright field in which both offices, the, State, the Copyright Office and then my office and the State Department were involved, was the negotiation of the abortive Stockholm, Stockholm Protocol to the Berne Convention in 1967 at the Stockholm Diplomatic Conference. The preparatory work for this conference can be dated back to an African studying, study meeting on copyright held in Brazzaville, Congo, in August 1963. And I assure you, this is not exactly a garden spot of the world. Uh, Cami and I attended this meeting. The notable fact uh, about the meeting was that the existing government, headed by a Catholic priest, who didn't take his priest, uh, priestly duties uh, too seriously, was overthrown while we were in Brazzaville. At the opening session of that meeting, I recall the Minister of Culture appeared, and notwithstanding the fact that in the distance we could hear shooting, and uh, there was smoke, uh, they had burned the prison, this fellow appeared and he said, I can assure you, uh, you've probably heard tales, there's some disorders here, but the meeting will go on as scheduled. Well, we held the morning session, the afternoon session never did resume, and this guy headed for the hills, I'm sure, because we, <laughs> we never saw him again. Uh, and in Drazzaville, it's not uh, exactly uh, a surprise that the government was overthrown, since uh, it was not exactly a modern army, because we looked out of the, uh, the uh, conference room, which was all open air, really, because it was in the tropics, right at the, almost at the equator, and noticed that uh, the there was a horse cavalry galloping down the streets with their drawn sabers and off in the distance. Well, I guess they never appeared again either, so. Uh, in any event, this was the sort of the precursor to the Stockholm Conference. And uh, they passed a resolution that uh, noting that developing countries had problems with respect to copyrighted works and this should be dealt with at a diplomatic conference, which ultimately took place in Stockholm in 1967. Uh, that was a broad, a, lot of, a conference which dealt with a number of matters, not only copyright, uh, the Berne Convention and the protocol, and we were there as an observer since, uh, of course, we are not a member of that convention, but uh, actually they also negotiated the convention establishing the World Intellectual Property Organization, which, uh, the United States did adhere to and which actually established uh, WIPO in the uh, replacing the earlier uh, secretary at Burpee. Uh, what emerged from this conference in 1967 was the Berne Protocol regarding developing countries. Uh, this protocol was so far out and unrealistic that no country ever ratified or acceded to it. Uh, the, um, next major international copyright diplomatic conference in which uh, the Copyright Office and my office worked together related to a parallel revision of the Universal Copyright Convention and the Berne Convention in Paris in July 1971. This was an extremely important conference. It did result in some very uh, significant conventions and uh, revisions of conventions, and the United States did adhere to it, as a matter of fact, as you know, they ratified. The U.S. delegation was co-chaired by CAMI and a Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, Bruce Ladd. Barbara Ringer and I were alternate delegates on this uh, delegation, and this was CAMI's uh, last conference before his retirement. And I uh, can say, if I just interject a personal note here, 
that Cammy uh, was one of the finest gentlemen. He was a scholar, but in addition to that, just a, a very fine, gentle person, and one that I always will prize his friendship. Uh, we had one of the smaller delegations at this conference, numbering almost 26 persons. And we had uh, Prowl, the leading private sector organizations represented. We had congressional uh, advisors, and we had a, a fair n a number of uh, government people on the delegation. As I have indicated, it was the most successful conference. It was a result of the outstanding wor work of experts such as Cami, Barbara Ringer, and from the private sector, Herman Finkelstein, General Counsel of ASCAP, Erwin Karp, uh, the uh, Council of the Authors League, Bella Linden, Professor Mer uh, Mel Nimmer, and others uh, too uh, numerous to mention. The foreign experts attending that conference would lead like an international copyright who's who. There is Professor Ulmer and Elizabeth Stoip of the Federal Republic of Germany, Valerio De Sanctis of Italy, Frank Keyes of Canada, Andre Caraver of France, Henry Olson of Sweden, William Wallace of the United Kingdom, and others. The 1971 revision of the UCC and the Berne Convention was a revision directed at keeping developing countries in the international copyright system. It was a very complex revision, but essentially it allowed developing countries to impose compulsory licensing systems on the rights of translation and reproduction granted to UCC works. And as I've already said, the United States did very readily ratify that 1971 text of the UCC. I might also mention the uh, Geneva Phonogram Convention, which was negotiated in October 1971, and the Brussels Satellite Convention, which was negotiated in May 1974, both of which were very successful convention. At the Geneva Phonograph Convention Diplomatic Conference, uh, we worked very closely with George Carey and Bob Hadel. At the Brussels Satellite Convention, by, we worked uh, on the delegation where Barbara Ringer, Louis Flax, and myself, that's probably the reason it was such a successful convention. <laughs> the uh, US, United States became a party to the Geneva Convention in March 1974. Today, there are 38 member states, and it is a very important tool against record piracy. We came, became a member of the Brussels Convention in March of this year, and although only nine states belong to it as of today, I believe that it will be of, of great importance to the United States in the future in view of all of this satellite uh, broadcasting of television works all over the world. Uh, as you know, Barbara Ringer resigned in May 1980 after almost seven years as register. In my view, uh, Barbara was and is one of the top copyright experts in the world. She has left her imprint not only in domestic copyright, but equally so on international copyright. Turning to the 1980s, I suppose a short an oversimplified characterization would, of, that, of those years would be the effect of high technology on copyright protection, for better or for worse. During this period, I had the pleasure of working closely with David Ladd on numerous bilateral matters. For example, the proposed PRC copyright law and the trip that a U.S. delegation headed by David and in the company of uh, Dorothy Schrader and uh, Louis Flax, uh, we laid the foundation for some very good discussions with the Chinese. Uh, they assured us, well, what year was that? That was 82, 83? Well, you can see, <laughs> yeah. the years rolled by. Anyway, two or three years ago, they assured us that we would see a draft copyright law in the near future. And as of uh, November 1985, we still haven't seen the draft. But they, again, they've assured us since then that uh, they are still working on it. There are uh, numerous WIPO, UNESCO, intergovernmental meetings 
that uh, the Copyright Office and the State Department have involved, been involved in relating to a wide range of pressing copyright issues today, such as copyright piracy, cable television, protection of computer software, integrated circuits, a meeting is, that is coming up in the near future. Uh, in 1985, probably the most significant international copyright development, and this is almost like deja vu, with Lewis referring back to some of the earlier uh, consideration by the United States of adherence to the Berne Convention, which incidentally has been going on for the, probably the last 90 years or so. Uh, probably the most significant development is the Joint Copyright Office State Department project looking toward U.S. adherence to the other major international copyright convention, the Berne Convention. We are working very closely with Erwin Karp's ad hoc working group on U.S. adherence to the Berne Convention, whose preliminary report should be out probably within the next couple of weeks. Uh, coming right down to the fall of 1985, in order to conclude this rather lengthy uh, presentation, may I say that I look forward uh, with a good deal of anticipation uh, to working with your current register. I've known Ralph for some time now in his capacity as senior counsel to Senator Mathias and have the, the greatest admiration for his substantive and political expertise. In conclusion, uh, may I say just a few words about my collaborator today, Louis Flax. Uh, I've worked with Louis on numerous projects uh, going back probably to Brussels in 1974. Uh, I have only the, the highest praise for his dedication and his expertise, and uh, not only that, it's fun to work with Lewis. Thank you. Well, I don't have anything to say uh, for once. Um, <laughs> Give me a minute, I'll think of something. Actually, I had a couple of questions uh, for Harvey. Um, I'll only try and make it one, two, or three, you know, so that there'll be time for your questions. Actually, I was curious to know what you thought about an issue which was a considerable problem last year. Um, didn't strictly concern copyright, but it had copyright implications. It's UNESCO. Back in 1952, UNESCO was a great place, doing great things in copyright in the UCC. And now, when we look back at those days, it seems almost um, idyllic or unreal, because the image of UNESCO is that uh, it is wandering off in all sorts of fields, touching on freedom of expression. The United States is withdrawn from UNESCO. A number of other countries have indicated that they're likely to follow our suit unless major and unlikely reforms are to take place within UNESCO. I guess my question really is, in light of the fact that we're in the UCC but out of UNESCO, and we're not in Bern, but a lot of the substantive work goes on in WIPO, it might be useful for us to get a little information about the World Intellectual Property Organization as a secretariat. What, what is it like to work there? Who are the people? How do they relate to the United States, which isn't a member of their copyright convention, um, but nonetheless very frequently has interests which are probably more closely reflective of the Berne Convention in its substance than in the Universal Copyright Convention in its relative simplicity, which incidentally is one of its great strengths. I don't mean that by way of criticism. And also the extent to which the politics of UNESCO might uh, tend to intersect with our copyright concerns in the UCC. That's about 10 different questions, Lewis. Well, pick one. <laughs> well, first of all, uh, the fact that the United States has withdrawn officially and formally from UNESCO is and has in no way affected our membership in the Universal Copyright Convention nor has it affected our membership in that important committee that I mentioned to you, the Intergovernmental Copyright Committee. We will continue uh, as a member of the Universal Convention and as a member of the Intergovernmental Committee. Uh, whether or not we go back into UNESCO again, I think depends on, 
on reforms uh, in the administration of UNESCO. Uh, that, uh, under the present uh, Director General, uh, Senegalese by the name of M. Beau, as long as he's in, I think he's in for another year or two, it's, I think it's very unlikely that the United States uh, will go back into it. I mean, it's a, a rather inept administration, and uh, shortly after we withdrew, or shortly before, there was a story going around UNESCO, and I, maybe you read some of it in the paper about the fire in the basement in their files. And uh, the story that was going around the UNESCO staff was that they were so inept they didn't even burn the right files. <laughs> but in any event, I don't think we'll be going back into UNESCO in the foreseeable future, but I do not think it'll affect any way our uh, participation in, in uh, the convention or in the com committee. As far as world, the World Intellectual Property Organization is concerned, as you know, the Director General is former employee of the Copyright Office, Arpad Bosch, and uh, he is just as dynamic and uh, workaholic as, as Arthur Fisher was. He, it's a small secretariat, I think around 300 people, but it's probably, well at least in my, to my knowledge, it's the most effective of the different UN organizations. Um, they turn out a tremendous amount of documentation, and we receive the documentation before the meeting, not at the meetings, as we did with some of the UNESCO meetings. Uh, it's the secretariat for the other major convention, which you know, uh, and which Lewis and I have both noted that we uh, would like very much. It, uh, maybe it's a personal view, but I think it, it's no secret within the government the position has been taken favoring, in principle, U.S. adherence to the Berne Convention, and uh, the, uh, in the administration itself, they have taken a position favoring adherence to the Berne Convention. So I, I think in the long term, uh, U.S. copyright interests can, international interests can best be served by the United States getting into the Berne Convention and as quickly as possible. And I know Ralph's uh, former boss, Senator Mathias, uh, I think it's quite, uh, I can say that uh, Senator Mathias also has indicated his strong support for United States uh, adherence to that convention. So I think that the future of international copyright really in the long term lies uh, within the Berne Convention. And I know at one point a few years ago, uh, the British said very openly in a meeting that they saw no reason why there should be two international copyright conventions that they saw ultimately an amalgamation of the two conventions in one copyright convention. And of course nobody responded to the British after they said that. Are there any questions? Why, why can't there continue to be these two conventions? I mean, what's changed over the years that makes Bern now so important that the United States joined? Well, there's nothing that says there can't do, uh, be two conventions, and there probably will be for a long time. Uh, it, it, it doesn't make sense. The, the membership in both conventions is uh, practically the same, with two, the exception of, uh, well, three countries, really, three major countries. The United States belongs only to the UCC. The Soviet Union belongs only to the UCC. Uh, the People's Republic of China at this point in time uh, do not belong to any convention. So that there is a, almost a complete duplication of membership. And uh, that's why I think the British were saying that uh, one convention, an amalgamation of the convention, uh, there would be desirable. There's no reason, that in response to your question, why the two conventions can't exist side by side, they do exist side by side, and they will continue to, I'm sure, into the foreseeable future. Yeah, let, let me add something to that. I, first, I agree with Harvey. Um, the premise of your question, we didn't mean to suggest that you can't have two conventions, you can have two, you can have three, it really doesn't matter, it just depends on how much money you want to waste. Um, but even though they can coexist, there is a price. First, it depends on what the conventions purport to do. Um, the Universal Convention in 1952 
was uh, launched upon the assumption that a very simple treaty based on national treatment and settling essentially the questions of when is a state party of the convention eligible for protection under the laws of another state would serve to bring the United States and a number of Latin American countries into multilateral simple copyright relations, mitigating the impact of formalities which were present in Latin American statutes and very strongly in the United States law. Well, neither of those, neither of those groups of states in the US were, were able to join the Berne Convention. So it was really a bridge to the Berne Convention. In, in some respects, a, a concession by the states party to Berne mostly Western European states, that some sort of an intermediary body was necessary to bring people first into the shallow water and then they'd feel better and then they'd swim out into the deep water and join burn. What's happened is the world's changed. <laughs> a large number of developing countries, by and large what we've seen is that the Anglophone African countries have tended to opt for membership in the Universal Copyright Convention, Francophone African countries have tended to opt for membership in the Berne Convention. The larger number of uh, newly emergent nations since 1960 have joined both. Um, the difficulty that people perceive is essentially political, not legal. It is that you have a fairly simple convention that is almost a tabula rasa that has pretensions to global legitimacy as an acceptable vehicle for the protection of authors' rights and its elaboration in the future. It means that uh, you can sit down and decide what is adequate and effective protection without reference to any traditional rights, limitations, exemptions, formalities, or term um, reflected in the convention. Um, th there is a term provision in the UCC, but it's for very particular reasons concerning the US law in effect at the time, much lower. And in fact, what even the norm was then. And I think the feeling of the Berne Convention states that those, that handful of countries, the dozen or so, that represent the intellectual, commercial, and legal core of authors' rights within the Berne Convention to see that there's some danger of siphoning off the commitment, not the membership, to the elaboration of the Berne Union as a collaborative, the principal collaborative organism to develop copyright law in favor of the more intensely political, new economic order sensitive universal copyright convention. But if your point's correct, the real issue is the United States needed the UCC because it had a law um, which in effect represented a much lower level involvement in international copyright transactions in the 50s than is present now. So the real issue is whether um, a kind of mid-course correction in our international copyright policies makes sense, and even more troublesome, whether it's possible to do so, given the, the, the very strong attachment we have to our very peculiar compromises in the 1976 Copyright Act. And I'm not speaking only of notice and things like that. Any others? Oh, it's what a satisfying sound. Right. Besides notice, what are, what are some of the other obstacles? I know something about the report. Well, there's, um, when the Authors League report comes out, then I think you see the opinion that really counts, which is the people who have to live with the copyright law of the United States and the Berne Convention if we were to join. And what it's really about is ownership and exercise of copyright, term of protection, rights, exemptions, limitations, the whole threat moral rights and the like. It, it's, it's really what the users, commercial and non-commercial, the authors and the copyright owners think of the problems that, that count. It's their point of view that's always kept us out. Um, it's their point of view that will get us in if we are to go in. This, it's generally acknowledged, just briefly, that the persistence of the copyright notice as a way of works falling into the public domain is a problem with the with, incompatible with the Berne Convention, which prohibits formalities for the uh, exercise and enjoyment of copyright. Um, some have suggested that the requirement of registration as a precondition for bringing a suit uh, is, is incompatible with the Berne Convention, but that issue hasn't been looked at since the 30s in connection with French law. And, um, Probably the renewal requirement is a pretty strong formality in the 
we're going to have it for the foreseeable future, um, that also would have to be changed. There, uh, no one seems to have noted the problem of recordation as a requirement for bringing an infringement suit or its relationship to registration as an impediment, but uh, my point of view, even though nobody agrees, is that it probably is a problem. There are perhaps the largest number of areas, are not really flat, clear problems, but anxieties. Um, questions of, we don't know what it means. We're not sure whether we're in compliance. We don't know what the impact of the Berne Convention would be on United States law and on our interests under US copyright law. And those areas concern the retroactive application of the Berne Convention, moral rights, the self-executing nature of the Berne Convention. By that I mean uh, Berne is really rather progressive and rather radical as treaties go. It is intended to establish as a goal a piece of international legislation which operates directly to create private rights in as many areas as possible among authors in works that are protected under the convention. Some sections of the Berne Convention do have a direct legislative effect, but the fact is the United States is one of the few countries that has a supremacy clause that admits of a self-executing treaty. And as a result, we're one of the few countries that has to take that sort of problem very, very seriously. It really is a question of what does Congress have to legislate affirmatively on and what can, can it let go by the boards because it's not an obligation. I think that people are concerned about whether or not the Berne Convention provides a useful way to protect works of applied art or industrial designs. Um, there is some flexibility in Berne, but I think everybody's curious to know what sort of options it has. Uh, I'm sure that, that the, the author's lead list is, 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 is probably somewhat longer, but I think between the handful of clear problems concerning formality, uh, the larger group concerns uh, areas of uncertainty as to what Berne means in the United States law. Are you involved in the development of the revision of the patent convention? I know this is strictly not topic here, but uh, what kind of progress have you made on that? I have lost track at a certain point. Uh, none. <laughs> I guess to the satisfaction of the U.S. private industrial property circles, because it's not a revision that the United States really wanted. It was a, a revision that developing countries very strongly pushed for, and uh, we will uh, oppose it unless there are some basic changes made. There. There's taught one. The real basic substantive problem is an exclusive compulsory license, which would almost effectively take away the uh, patent rights of the foreign patent holder in a developing country. So that uh, the revision right now is not even on the back burner, it's in the refrigerator, <laughs> because uh, we don't presently even have a next session of that diplomatic conference schedule. Well, uh, without going into great, yeah, without going into great de detail, I'd like to leave very shortly. Uh, I think the political climate today is, is a lot different than it was back in 69, 70, and 71. Then, I think there was a, a very good rapport and communication between uh, the industrialized countries, the market economy countries, and the developing countries. And uh, we were looking for a common ground, uh, a compromise, and uh, we found it in, in the 1971 uh, text of the UCC in the Paris Act of the Universal Convention. The, the climate since then, you know, like 15 years later, has almost been confrontational on the intellectual property side, and particularly in the, uh, with respect to the Paris Industrial Property Convention. And, it, and it maybe it goes back a little bit uh, 
You could compare what happened at Stockholm with the Stockholm Protocol of the Berne Convention, which was so far out and so unrealistic that nobody adhered to it. And some of the uh, demands of developing countries and proposals with respect to uh, patents in the revision of the Paris Convention are so unrealistic and impractical, and that they'll be self-defeating. Uh, the United States, even if this were to go forward to conclusion, the United States would never adhere to such a text. And secondly, uh, if it were, if it did come into force, and uh, were in force for uh, a number of developing countries, foreign nationals, from uh, industrialized countries just wouldn't take out patents there. So it would be a self-defeating thing. But I think it's the political climate today is a lot different than it was in 1969 and 70, 71, when people were looking for solutions rather than problems. You mentioned a forthcoming set of discussions or a conference on computer technology and software protection. Semiconductor chips. Semiconductor oh, chips. Semiconductor. Integrated. What, what's the likelihood of that going the same way uh, of the patent discussions? I mean, are they likely to have any? Uh, oh, it does have certain. Ex this is really the very first meeting, so I, I can't give you a very definitive answer. It has certain provisions in there which uh, may provide for exceptions. Uh, for developing countries and that. It's a very simple uh, convention. It doesn't spell out uh, exactly what the national laws, the domestic laws will be. It, it allows uh, the uh, various countries, member states, to uh, protect semiconductor chips, integrated circuits under patent law, under copyright law, or under sui generis. Uh, I don't think that the, I think it was, I'm rather optimistic about the outcome. I don't think developing countries are going to make any outrageous demands, frankly. Yeah, I agree. Sorry. Yeah. Um, could you go through the process? What we're doing is like the copyright office and the State Department. Well, eventually, the U.S. government position is reached, whether it's on a paper or whether it's part of a, a position with regard to intervention. Could you describe for us the process of which that's arrived at, who inputs into it, who is, how does it reach its conclusion? Uh, well, there's no scenario. It's, it's almost like playing it by ear. Um, for example, I guess probably the best way is to take the, uh, the preparation we're making for the integrated circuits meeting. Uh, there is a draft, we got the documents, there's a draft treaty uh, sent to all of the member states of WIPO by the Secretariat. Uh, we have had this treaty now for some weeks, since I guess last summer. The Copyright Office and the Patent and Trademark Office, both of whom have an interest in it, sent it out to all of the various organizations that they uh, have contacts with and they feel would be interested in the subject matter. Uh, the State Department, we sent it out to uh, various uh, organizations that are represented on our uh, International Industrial Property Panel because, as I've already uh, alluded to the fact, it may be patent or come under patent protection, copyright protection, or a very generous type of protection. We sent it out to a large number of people ask for written comments. The comments up to this time have not uh, been flooding in. Um, we will, uh, the Patent and Trademark Office and the Copyright Office, will be doing a draft, a first draft of a position paper. Um, it'll be circulated to any interested uh, government agency, and there aren't uh, too many that will be interested in, I suppose, Probably Maine Commerce, a uh, U.S. Trade Representative may want to take a look at it. Uh, <coughs> we will then put the position paper into final shape and uh, use that as our guidelines uh, for the uh, meeting. Louis, you have anything to add? No, we make it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Any other questions? No. Well, Harvey actually does have to get back to the State Department. As you may know, um, there's great interest in intellectual property all over the federal government right now. It's one of the hot subjects in the evolving trade policies of the United States. And a whole series of agencies who never particularly gave a second thought to copyright are now very anxious to show how much they care. And what this means for people who have cared a long time, like Harvey, is the necessity of staying close to the phone and rapidly developing a situation where, the, in effect, the president has uh, instructed the executive branch to go out and try and find some useful framework to protect American intellectual property, including copyrights, in every country in the world. So he has my thanks, both for that and for coming here today. Thank you.